On the 25th of January, people responded to a call for uh, Egyptians to go out and express anger and express their hope also for a better future. And this was brilliantly captured in a very simple slogan that read, Bread, Freedom, Human Dignity. We unseated a dictator after 18 days of protests, not just in Tahrir Square, but all over Egypt. We felt that this was the first day in the rest of our lives. We're not celebrating now. We are still facing the persistence of all the violations and all the abuses and restrictions on our freedom to express our views, to associate, to challenge those in power. <laughs> The only way out of this moment of arrest that we find our revolution in is going to be a serious effort to seek the truth about what happened in the last 30 years under Mubarak, hold the perpetrators of violations accountable, and then embark on a process of rebuilding every institution that was destroyed by the dictator. Without this full and comprehensive process of justice and restoring dignity to the people, we are going to continue to live under the same practices and policies as we did under Mubarak. And in that case, then a second revolution is just a must. At its heart, transitional justice is wrestling with and confronting the past, the legacy of injustice, crimes, abuses. It is only if you address the past that you can have a more prosperous, peaceful, democratic future. La violencia ha sido elemento constitutivo de la conformación de la nación colombiana. Desde épocas anteriores a la República, pero durante el siglo XX, de manera in inevitable y con un signo, un destino casi chesperiano, dramático y trágico, La violencia se convirtió en un elemento de la economía, en un elemento del poder y se reprodujo la violencia como un factor de toda la configuración de la sociedad colombiana. The Lord's Resistance Army, headed by Joseph Cohn. In their operations, would always attack villages, they would get the able-bodied men, and the school-going children, the boys, they would then force them to do all the heinous acts like cutting off people's ears, noses, and they would make sure that they do this beginning with the people's relatives, their close families. Then they would set ablaze the houses and then they would go with the girls to have them as their wives. La guerre qu'a connue la République démocratique du Congo est appelée la Troisième Guerre mondiale parce que, en termes de nombre des victimes enregistrées, on estimerait ça à 4 millions de morts, sans compter les nombres de celles-là qui n'ont pas pu être répertoriées. 
C'est un crime contre l'humanité. What happened in Egypt and Tunisia and what is happening still in the rest of the Arab world taught us many lessons. This entire notion that maintaining stability is a justification for perpetuating injustice or tolerating unjust regimes is truly misguided that in fact it is injustice precisely that creates the preconditions for instability in the future. Historias personales de desplazamiento, de victimización, de asesinatos en la familia, secuestros, todas las formas de victimización posibles están sintetizadas a veces en una familia, pues vamos a tener la tercera parte de la población colombiana ha sido víctima en su familia. Quiere decir que aquí no hay una, una diferencia entre la sociedad y las víctimas. Actuellement, même dans la vie quotidienne, les civils commencent à recourir au viol, même dans des villes qui n'ont pas connu de guerre. Les deux provinces de Kivu, à l'est de la RDC, on enregistre par jour des fois 10 cas de viol. Or, ce sont des cas des femmes qui peuvent encore avoir la force pour aller euh, à l'hôpital se faire soigner. A society in which uh, fundamental rights have been systematically violated is a society in which life is characterized by fear. And you live in a context in which the very fact of undertaking some efforts has been thwarted because of fear. Uh, you understand how truly important it is to try to make up for the legacies of uh, massive human rights violations. Les gens pensent qu'au nom de la consolidation de la paix, il faut amnistier tout le monde. Or, cette amnistie fragilise la vie de la communauté parce qu'elle se sent délaissée. Elle pense que c'est injuste, aujourd'hui, elle qui a été victime, de se voir non dédommagée en termes de réparation par rapport à ce qu'elle a vécu, mais par contre, son violeur se retrouve être son autorité aujourd'hui. Thomas Lubanga Dailo is responsible as co-perpetrator for the charges of enlisting and conscripting children under the age of 15 years. When we seek accountability for the most heinous crimes against humanity and genocide and war crimes, for instance, we are seeking to achieve a society which is governed by the rule of law, the upholding of the sacred value of human life, and by really seeking to serve these principles and values in society. My wife said my son is nowhere to be found. He appeared on the fourth day. He was floating on top of the water. Then we picked him up, then I buried him. What transitional justice does, for example, what a truth commission does, what a process of reparations does, is to include in the national agenda the concerns and interests of a population that have always been excluded. The justice needed at the moment in Uganda is so much more than the criminal justice. We are looking at reparation. And in reparation, we shall look at uh, services like healthcare, resettlement, incentives to have them pick on a livelihood. We shall look at psychosocial support for the victims. Then, from that state, we can always pursue the prosecution of the leaders of the rebel ranks because they don't need to walk away scot-free. 
The fight for justice is also a fight over narratives, over storytelling, and the fact that we don't have a coherent process of seeking the truth about what happened in the past, holding perpetrators of past violations accountable, rebuilding our country and its democratic institutions. This does not only have an impact on our ability as a nation to move from dictatorship towards democracy, but even the details of what exactly happened in January of 2011 are being contested now. Societies that want to deal with the past do it because they reject the atrocities, the violations that have taken place. There is an enormous hope in transitional justice policies and measures. And that hope is that what you are going to build in the future is going to be radically different from the past. There is an increased understanding of the need for longer term sustainable solutions and that whether it be transitional justice or humanitarian assistance in the immediate aftermath of conflict, plus economic reconstruction, plus security, and all of these pieces have to be fitted together. Transitional justice measures contribute to the reactivation of civil society in contexts in which everyone had been intimidated and once uh, the measures start being discussed, it's as if doors were opened and people started relying on one another for the sake of raising claims against the government. In Cambodia, if you talk to school children, if you talk to the general populace, much of whom was under 30, they really didn't know what happened to their society. They didn't know in the 1970s, somewhere between 30 and 40 the percent of the population died at the hands of the Khmer Rouge. As a result of the trials that have happened there and the opening up of that dialogue, that public space to talk about what happened, we have a change in the curriculum. So the Khmer Rouge period is in the textbooks now. If we think about a situation like Germany, which also had a difficult transition. Hermann Wilhelm Göring, you must plead guilty or not guilty. One of the things that happened in Germany was that in the curriculum, the truth was eventually taught. We've seen in Argentina and many other places, rounds of prosecutions taking place at different times. The value of transitional justice is as a set of approaches uh, is that it gives you different strings to draw on at different times and recognising that none of these processes alone is ever going to be the magic bullet. Colombia has a lot of potential as a success story for transitional justice, but a success that's measured as in other places, oftentimes in small games. So you won't have a Colombia with all of its problems solved but a Colombia that recognizes victims with institutions that respond more generally to the needs of its citizens, which will find it increasingly difficult to turn the institutions of the state against the population. Violence in Peru was felt as an experience of others. I think that what Processes like the Truth Commission or the trial of Fujimori created was a counter-argument to that. What they created was the presumption that actually this story is something that happened to us and that there is a common humanity and a common level of empathy and solidarity that we need to activate in these kind of situations. Violence, therefore, was and is a problem that we all suffered be it that we are direct victims or not. Transitional justice has a big role in restoring dignity. The people need the truth to heal, to see that peace can prevail and to deter 
future uprisings because of the ills of the past. The promise of transitional justice is that peace is going to be more than the cessation of hostilities. Transitional justice promises the causes of war are going to be squarely faced and squarely dealt with. That is, what truth, justice, reparations, and measures of non-repetition do is to make authentic, sustainable democracy and sustainable peace. People should never be placed in a situation in which they are supplicants, in which they have to beg for a good treatment. This is one of the fundamental ways of measuring progress in modern politics and one of the reasons why we worry about the implementation of transitional justice measures in the wake of massive human rights abuses. Things are different now, and we are a different generation. I have great confidence that people are never going to accept the emergence of another autocracy to replace Mubarak. The reason we need transitional justice in Egypt is that without it, all the institutions, policies, and practices of the Mubarak time are going to continue because the message has not yet been delivered. The message that today's Egypt is a new Egypt, where these practices of the past have no place.